So I screwed up. Uh, in the last couple of videos that I had done, I had mentioned at one point that I had already talked about the intermediate value theorem. And at this point, we have to call upon the intermediate value theorem, which I think I've talked about before, but if I haven't, there's something wrong. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. To start off, we'll just go over what the intermediate value theorem says. That is letting F from the closed interval A to B to the real numbers be a continuous function if L is a real number such that L is between F of A and F of B, then there exists a C in the interior of the domain of F such that F of C is equal to L. Now at first glance, this theorem is fairly straightforward. Most of the mathematical terms that arise in the statement of the theorem should align with your intuition behind them and you can pretty easily explain what this theorem says without doing much math at all. To illustrate this, let's take this shoelace, for example. It's our interval, and if we go ahead and apply some function to it by bending it, we get a curve. And on that curve, we can see that all of the values between the endpoints occur somewhere along the interior of the shoelace. And there you go. But that should be a bit unsatisfying. There's a lot of mathematical stuff lurking in the background that is a bit more technical when you're trying to be more rigorous about it. The two main things at play here are the axiom of completeness and continuity. To start off, we'll go with the axiom of completeness, which is also probably the biggest reason that you wouldn't have seen this proved in a generic high school calculus course. The axiom of completeness deals a lot with sets, and sets aren't something that you really put emphasis on in high school calculus beyond like what your domain of the function is or what are the bounds of your integral. It's got a bit of math to it, but it's mostly intuitive, like all good axioms should be. We should agree on the axiom of completeness since it is an axiom. It feels kind of silly, but I mean, axioms are just the rules that you agree to play by. We can state the axiom of completeness in the following way. It says that any non-empty set of real numbers that is bounded above has a least upper bound. That least upper bound is what we define as the supremum of a set. So for example, the supremum of the open set from zero to one is one, but there is no maximum here. That's the main difference between supremums and maximums. Maximums have to be in the set, while supremums do not. Here are a few more subsets if you'd like to do some more practice finding the supremum and maximum to get more practice and develop a better intuition around what a supremum is. Aside from those problems, we're not actually going to worry about the very closely related idea of an infimum here, because we actually won't need it. But infimums come from reformulating the axiom completeness with a set bounded from below. Next on the docket is continuity. Continuity is a bit more technical than the intuition behind it lets on. So a function is continuous at a point C in its domain if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that whenever the absolute value of the difference between X and C is less than delta, the absolute value of the difference in the images is less than epsilon. We say that F is continuous on a set if it is continuous at all points in that set. So, if you're seeing this definition for the first time, there are a lot of places you can get pretty bogged down and confused. The two problem symbols with understanding this definition are epsilon and delta. To visualize this a bit more, we can return to our shoelace with a bit more detail. We can choose a point to be our C on the shoelace. And next, a choice of delta tells us how far we're willing to go out in both directions from our chosen C. So let's say that delta is one and that corresponds to going out to these two pieces of tape on the string. Continuity tells us that when we map this, 
there is going to be some constant epsilon that corresponds to an extreme in the vertical difference between the image of C and the images of the two endpoints. If there was a break somewhere in the shoelace, we would have a major issue because the delta wouldn't be able to guarantee a restraint on how far the images were apart. We can see that here with this graph of a line and this graph of a broken line. For epsilon equal to one, there is no delta that guarantees that we will be within one unit of the broken line graph. But on the normal line graph, we can see that we can find such a delta, it's just one. Okay, so at this point, you probably feel like we're way off track and I don't know what I'm talking about because those two topics feel very unrelated. Or at the least, they come from the same family of things. It's just, it's not very clear how they're going to be used to prove the intermediate value theorem. But with those two concepts and a nod to supremums, we'll be able to actually prove the intermediate value theorem. So we can go ahead and start that now. Recall that the intermediate value theorem can be stated as follows. Let f from the closed interval a, b to the real numbers be continuous. If L is a real number such that L is between the images of A and B, then there exists a C in the interior of the domain of F such that the image of C is equal to L. So let's begin by making this easier to talk about because we don't want to run around chasing L's all over the place. Without loss of generality, we can go ahead and translate the function so that L will always equal zero. Notice that translating does not change the shape of the function, so we're not breaking continuity in any way. And we can illustrate that by just looking at a curve without a coordinate grid and picking a point on that curve that we want to be our L, and then drawing the coordinate grid so that that L has a value of zero in the Y coordinate. The other simplifying move is to recognize that both cases of L being between the images of A and B will have identical arguments, just with some switching of the placements of A and B. So again, without loss of generality, we can consider the case where the image of A is less than L, which is equal to zero, which is less than the image of B. Now we can go ahead and start actually doing some work towards the proof. We consider a subset of our domain, call it K, which is the set of all points X in the domain of F, such that the images of those X are less than or equal to zero. Since F of A is less than zero and F of B is greater than zero, K is non-empty and B is an upper bound of K. So K is a subset of the real numbers that is bounded above, thus K has a least upper bound by the axiom of completeness, or rather the supremum of K exists. Consider C equal to the supremum of K. Now we have three cases. The image of C can be less than, greater than, or equal to zero. And one of these must be true. So if we can rule out two of the cases, we know that the third is the reality. Before we go ahead and start ruling out certain ones of those cases, we're gonna go ahead and focus on what the function being continuous grants us. So since F is continuous on its domain, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that when the absolute value of the difference between X and C is less than delta, the absolute value of the difference of the images of X and C is less than epsilon. Notice that the inequality between X and C gives us that x is contained in the interval between c minus delta and c plus delta. Also note that for any epsilon, we can find such a delta. So if we choose an epsilon, we know that there exists such a delta. So we're gonna go ahead and fix our epsilon to be the absolute value of the image of c over two. Then by continuity, there exists a delta such that we have the following inequality. This implies that the image of x must be between these two values. In the case where f of c is less than zero, 
we get the following containment. Here we get that every x within delta of c has an image that is less than zero. So there is an element of k that is greater than c. So c cannot be an upper bound of k. Thus, c cannot be the least upper bound, or in other words, it can't be the supremum. And this is a contradiction because we defined c as the supremum of k. When f of c is greater than zero, we get this containment, which looks very similar to the other case, but it's not identical to it, which tells us that for every x within delta of c, f of x is greater than zero. So there is another upper bound of k that is less than c. So c cannot be the least upper bound, which is what we defined it to be. So we have yet another contradiction. But since the image of c must have been one of those three things, it must have been less than zero, greater than zero, or equal to zero, and exactly one of them. Since we ruled out the image of c being greater than zero and the image of c being less than zero, by process of elimination, the image of c must be equal to zero, which completes the actual proof. So there you have it. That is a proof of the intermediate value theorem that I probably should have went over a few weeks ago or a while ago, because it's, it's a fundamental thing that'll come up a lot. And if I want to use it, I should have a proof of it that I can reference somewhere when it comes up. Anyhow, that's all I have for you today. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics videos. As always, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time.